I served my villain wife who cheated and treated me like a trash bag and got crazy after divorce. It's about two years for me, 40M, from DD with my cheating ex, 39F, we were high school sweethearts at the end of her senior year. I had just graduated and met her working in a video store in a small suburb. We were close friends for about six months and eventually it led to me getting up the courage to plant a kiss and the rest as they say is history. Unfortunately, as this tale has found its way to the sub, we all know it didn't end well. I had never really had friends who cheated, never heard anyone talk about it, and I had no idea the amount of trauma that was on the way. It was a random occurrence that I had even found out. My folks were visiting and my ex took off to go to a co-worker's wedding in another state. She had told me about the event about two weeks prior. My ex had a few friends that weren't mutual, nothing out of the ordinary, but there I was watching a movie with the folks and realized I misplaced my phone during the day. I was holding my iPad and browsing during the flick and tepidly shifted to the find my iPhone feature. Married for 10 years, we had a lot of accounts tied together, and iTunes was one of them. Instead of my phone being first on the list, it was hers. Instead of being out of state, she was at a local hotel about an hour away that doubles as a popular brewery. They hold weddings there all the time, and I was sure that was it, I'd find her there with her co-workers. Around 8 p.m. I made it out to the hotel and couldn't find her anywhere, looking for two hours I narrowed the GPS to a certain wing. She wasn't in the restaurant, so I did my best Eddie Murphy impression. That's what I call it when you con your way into somewhere you shouldn't be or get free stuff, cause Eddie was a master of that in all his early movies. I head to the front desk and say gee my sister was at that wedding earlier and I'm afraid some guy took advantage of her cause she's drunk, can you give me the room number? After slight hesitation and asking me to provide a phone number, they pointed me to the room. My heart raced as I turned a couple corners now, knowing what I was going to find. I knocked on the door and tried to channel Eddie again room service. I mentioned in the most pleasant tone I could muster while hiding my anger and rage. A male answered that I must have the wrong room. Immediately my cover was blown, I think I have the right FNG room. How about you open up so we can have a conversation? My cheating spouse starts texting me, finally found out, the jig is up. She says she wants to talk in the morning and that she refuses to come out of the room. Oh okay, stay the rest of the night with your lover, got it. I linger for about an hour just to see if they'll come out, at this place the restrooms are in the hallways European style, but neither person emerged and I gave up. I went and took photos of her car for some kind of proof, and went home heartbroken to a sleepless night. She asked me to meet her in a public park where she knew there'd be people. She actually said that. Oh okay, never ever laid a finger on you or raised my voice at you in 20 years, but now domestic violence is a concern. Making her wait, I get to the park a few minutes late and realize that my expectations are still off. Even though I got the coldest shoulder the night before I was ready to make this work, to fix it. I came with a forgiving heart expecting remorse, surely my wife of 10 to 11 years wouldn't gaslight our whole existence. She's in tears, says she's sorry, looks like the whole time she's just sorry she was caught. Told her how I found out, and she smirked at it. We discussed her coming home and I was both appalled and mesmerized to hear I just can't go back to the way things were, I'm so trapped there. 3. Oh okay, so she's the victim, Raiyite, she spent three days in a hotel downtown, presumably just spending time with her lover, trying to decide if she should come back home. The AP was in a relationship too, has a 12-year-old son, and maybe that baggage was too much for her. She came home. Completely listless for a week, would hardly speak to me, demanded we sleep in separate bedrooms. Claims she'll work on this, but just needs space after all she's been through. She's done seeing the AP. We do the right thing and start marital counseling. Session 1, no further details come up, I ask for transparency and I've been going nuts researching affairs on the internet. She just maintains she can't go back to the way things were, but in no way can verbalize why our life wasn't happy or fulfilling enough and what is meant by her statement. Luckily for me, the therapist spots something and pointedly asks you've ended the affair, right? Shock and awe. She hadn't. Well uh, I was going to call him and let him know but I haven't yet. 
As I began the slow troll into the trickle truth, she confessed somewhat that she'd been with for at least one year prior. It was unbeknownst to me utterly and completely. Still happy in the bedroom, and she manipulated me with gifts. At one point, she gave me a watch that was engraved on the underside loving you more every second. She'd remembered to send me texts and call when out of town on business slash affair frolicking. Eventually, I'm just a ball of tears and weighing my options of going to jail, just getting out of this crap right now, or sticking in the marriage I am so committed to. I love this woman with every ounce of my being. Session 2, Transparency is abysmal, in fact my wife has turned off location sharing on all devices and changed all her passwords to everything. Oh okay, how dare I ask for such a thing when she's so damaged and in mourning. Cheating ex asks for an open relationship and that'll fix everything. I'm appalled and desperate and just in a terrible mental state and shamefully I agree. I think I secretly know that it's over but don't know how to get my physical self to agree. The therapist corners her saying she needs to break it off with the AP, still no word on that, and that polyamory might not be healthy at this point in our relationship. My ex vows never to go back to therapy because that lady was mean to her. Oh okay, starting to see a pattern here. I cry every night deep and terrible sobs. This woman who loved me and shared the utmost intimacy, all of the sudden, doesn't want anything to do with me. We pass each other around the house like ghosts of our former selves. I yell and scream at the world randomly from time to time, it's the darkest period I can recall in my life. We have Zex, I think it's makeup Zex, but when we're done she says she just needed to get off and that we never really loved each other. Ouch. Oh okay, here I thought we had a great relationship that never lost its spark, we were intimate in the bedroom two to four times a week always. I make a move, maybe it's a mistake. I'd download Tinder and go on a couple dates. I actually tell the people I'm married and probably getting a divorce. I was super transparent before meeting up with these people. One told me if I finalized the divorce to give her a call, cause I'm a great guy. The other took me home to her bed. I wished I would've waited simply because this gave my ex firepower and mild justification for the affair. We'll get to that in a brief moment, I'm almost done with the crazy train. The same weekend she goes on an overt camping trip with her AP, tells me about it in the name of transparency. Meanwhile, it doesn't validate anything else I'm asking about. It was this setup that made me continue to feel worthless and why I slept with the tinder fling. By Monday I've had enough, astonishingly I'm still willing to work through it and repair the marriage that isn't there. WS goes on a business trip and at this point I really have no idea what's going on, there's absolutely zero trust. I call her and demand you leave this man, you commit to loving me, you rebuild this trust immediately or I'm leaving before you get home. She responded that she just wasn't sure she could do all those things. It is no longer a marriage, but a disaster that needs a clean-up crew. While she's away I pack all my necessary belongings, grab the dog, and move in with some friends. She really didn't think I'd do it, she called me sobbing that night, why had I moved my stuff out? Total trip to crazy town. I told her she'd better act soon, that after nearly two months of dealing with this, she needed to make a decision. I could no longer live with her as part of this situation and that time is expiring shortly. I told her more than likely in two months or less I'd probably be firmly planted in the divorce camp. That she'd done nothing to work toward my side and done nothing but make misuse of comments with her selfishness and endless need to be validated by men. She responded to this by telling me it was my fault for finding out about the affair. In her words, she wasn't looking for a way out, but would have played the good housewife role for the rest of our lives if I just wouldn't have found out. I was sickened and almost driven mad by what I heard on the phone. Who was this person I thought I knew? Who do I share my life with? Who valued me so little that I was a throwaway object or at most only there to placate her wants and desires? She backpedaled and exclaimed, this could be a good thing, we'll grow into something new and we'll go on dates together and be excited to see each other again. If it's meant to be, then we'll get back together, seriously WTF? Even in this state, I knew relationships are something you work at, and that love is a practice, and I was getting none of that from this horrific shell of a human being. 
About a week later I tried meeting up with her, she said she wanted to discuss the divorce. It really just ended up being her wanting to flirt with me and then control my advances. She'd say how much she cared about me, but if I tried to touch her leg she'd say she wasn't ready for that yet. Since I had moved out, she insanely also moved out and was paying double rent by getting a nice city apartment just a couple blocks from the bar we happened to be at. When I offered to walk her home she scoffed and said she'd be fine and also wasn't ready for me to see her new place. Oh okay, so been your husband for nearly 11 years, together for 20, and now I can't touch your leg or walk you home. Alone with the dog, in my new rented room with my friends, I bit the pillow hard and sobbed harder that night than ever in my life. It wasn't my wants or desires this time, but I knew it was over, truly over. I knew the woman I loved was gone, maybe the rose-tinted glasses were lifted, but I knew it would be in my best interest to never interact with this person again and cut them out of my life. I was devastated because I truly and deeply gave my love to this person and thought all these years it had been reciprocated. As my therapist and many on here have told me, I was the lobster in a pot. I didn't see the red flags when she hated my friends or told me her friends hated me. I didn't see the red flags when she'd buy me close and parade me like a trophy, oh okay, well I'm kinda fit and handsome. I didn't see the red flags when she started traveling endlessly for work. Nor did I see them when I asked her how she really felt and if there was anything that could make our relationship better. Part of it is the eyes of love, and part of it was her nasty manipulation that I couldn't see until now. Nothing was ever enough for her. Not my job, not our house we owned, not the work I did on the house. It was all a ruse that fit perfectly with my codependency. I wanted to fix things, and to be good enough, and she was very capable at causing enough disaster and dangling enough carrots to keep me engaged. I wasn't looking to have love reciprocated but to love her so much it was enough for both of us. With my head clear, I resolved that the divorce was going to happen and with her crazy attitude it meant I was filing all the paperwork. I wish I could end this mega rant here, but you've only seen the awakening this far, the claws are about to come out. We hadn't spoken in three weeks and I felt like I was making the right decisions in my life. I'm surrounded by friends, moving forward, and gaining some clarity. I've realized the trap that I was in and made a firm decision to not get back together. Ring, ring. Oh, who could that be? It's my WS, we were supposed to meet for coffee to discuss the divorce and entangling paperwork. She tells me she can't make it at the designated time, but to text her two hours later and we can meet up. Fine. I follow suit, jumping through more hoops, and upon texting she tells me she's up at the nearby family mountain cabin and that I should come up for the week and stay with her. Oh okay, I'll just cast aside all my integrity and the small amount of self-respect I just discovered to jump back in the sack. Hell and no. We won't go. I declined the invitation after stating the importance of working through the divorce process. She gets flustered and somehow kind of angry that I'm not willing to drop everything in my life and come running up to the cabin. I ask her what about the AP and her response is he broke up with her as soon as I was out of the picture. Karma is a fickle creature sometimes I guess. We finally meet for coffee and I bring all the documents, gushing comments pour out from her about how good I look and how well I seem to be doing. Nope, I'm freaking devastated and this isn't a game to me lady, what's up? We cover the details about splitting up the house of which she says she's entitled to more than half, I'm not to touch her 401k, and as a compromise, I get to keep my business untouched that I worked my tail off on building for 10 years. I'm going to stay in her healthcare for the duration of the divorce, and will tidy this situation up as fast as possible. As I turn to make my exit she pursues and follows me to my car murmuring about things. Spinning on my heel, I ask if she has anything to say for herself. Frantically, I'm searching for remorse, perhaps a splinter of a shred of the person I thought loved me. It spouts out in a phrase more akin to a question than an answer, I'm so. I'm sorry. For what? I retorted. For, uh. I'm sorry for what I did. The words trailed off as if released by the smallest church mouse in Zootopia. It was a benign effort that reeked not of remorse in action but shell shock from being caught. In a way it was helpful, 
It let me know that my assumptions were now correct and that I knew where I stood. She wasn't sad because of anything she did, only that she had lost me as an asset with her cover blown and now wanted this man back in her life, who at one time would do absolutely anything for her. It was the only apology I would ever receive. She asks me what our narrative is going to be, and I pause trying to discern the question. Yeah, like, what are we going to tell people? What are we going to say that happened, that maybe we just mutually decided to see other people or something, what's our story? Oh, okay, holy crap. Yeah, our story, well you can say whatever you want, but I'm absolutely going to tell the truth to anyone who will listen. That is what happened, you broke my heart, you stepped out on marriage, and now you want your cake. I've had enough, and I don't need to create a story to feel better about myself. K, by E, I turn and walk away, and as soon as I cross the street a train comes, ending our conversation. I immediately get in my car and text all her family about the end of the marriage and why it happened. No for real, we're talking Wolverine Claws. I felt good about shutting the door, knowing there was no healthy way to patch things up and realizing it wasn't a healthy relationship in the first place. As the divorce process took shape other tragedies began to fall my way. I was hit with a full double-barrel tool. Right before D-Day about three months earlier when my W.S. was out on one of her trips for work or sexual affairs our house flooded on Super Bowl Sunday. I went to a friend's house and came home to find half a foot of water in our garage. Supposedly she was in Amsterdam where some field offices were, but when I called to tell her about the disaster it sounded like she was right next door. Either way she just starts yelling at me to fix it, of course that's what I'm doing. Had I been smart, I would have ran to Home Depot the last few minutes they were open and grabbed a sump pump to drain the driveway. Luckily, our garage was attached to a finished basement and was the lowest point on the property. However, water has totally invaded the garage and almost breached the step up to gain entry into the house. I called a friend who's a landscape architect and handy in all kinds of ways. We fill sandbags until midnight but record rain is thwarting us as we go. We've saved the property for a few minutes, but with record rainfall, that year it's about to crest through. We came up with an idea to siphon the water from the driveway into my basement utility room where the drain is. We grab 60-foot garden hoses and I start pulling with my lungs to draw the water over. It works. Besides getting a mouthful of groundwater, I get a nice steady stream flowing to the drain at gallons per minute. The driveway doesn't recede, but it doesn't overflow anymore. This gave me some time to bail calf deep water around the house, using a shop vac I pull up about 5 gallons at a time and heave it over. We have one gutter leaking and instead of going to the French drain it's pouring into the driveway. I start filling a huge garbage can that has to be emptied every 3 hours or it fills with rainwater. I'm soaked, I'm in the rain and water and haven't slept for 24 hours. When I do sleep I set an alarm to get up and bail to make sure no damage happens. The next morning, I fly to Home Depot and grab an electric pump, it literally saves the day. This tiny $50 or less pump diverts over 3,000 gallons of water in an hour, in about three hours it's completely moved the driveway down the street to run off. Yep, I had nearly 9,000 gallons sitting on my driveway, calf to knee deep. The same day I go into work and see my landlord for the business, he runs a construction company and I lament my tail. He immediately calls his disaster team and sends home free industrial dehumidifiers to soak up any water from the drywall and the structure. I leave these running for a couple days, the pump is still going in the driveway when my WS comes home. She starts to tell me that I was stressing her out with this situation and should have waited to tell her when she got back. Oh okay, thought you'd want to know about possibly losing the house and almost causing $40,000 in potential damages. Then she proceeded to state that the pump in the driveway is so embarrassing and that if I don't move it she will. Mind you it's still raining, still trying to flood the house and my neighbors have even come over to offer help. I come home from a morning appointment and find the pump moved to the garage. WTF? Eventually, I get the gutter repaired and it stops raining enough to let the water recede. About a week later on the nose, I come down with an awful flu I can't shake. On any regular spring Saturday, I start taking in movies and resting. Mid-afternoon my chest starts to really hurt and won't subside despite over-the-counter medication. 
I mentioned to my W.S. what's going on and I think it's getting serious. Can't you take care of yourself, ugh. Well, I'm not driving you to the urgent care, I'll go with you, but I'm not driving. Fine, I'll drive myself to the hospital, thanks for coming with me, that's so gracious of you sweetie. I get to the ER at the hospital and get all checked in. When I arrive, they notice my oxygen has dipped a little bit, but nothing alarming. We wait for over three hours and my chest is pounding, it's getting hard to breathe. My ex refuses to ask anyone to see me, so I stumble to the front desk and almost fall over. They say they'll get to me and put me in a wheelchair. Finally someone comes and takes more vitals, but doesn't really get to the root of the problem. I say I think I have pneumonia, my chest hurts, and I can't breathe. They downplay it and say probably not, but move me to a stretcher in an unoccupied room. I wait about another hour and at this point I'm really confused and barely breathing. My ex is just staring at me with dagger eyes and totally unhelpful. I literally start yelling, help. Someone help me, over and over again, much to this woman's chagrin. I don't care. I feel like I'm dying. I am dying. After about three to five minutes of this someone comes in upset that I'm yelling, but then agrees to look me over. Turns out my oxygen has dropped to around 50%, which is life-threatening on its own, and my blood has nearly turned septic. I have bacterial pneumonia, I most likely developed it when I swallowed that bit of groundwater in my mouth, saving the house. She never thanked me. She actually said she deserved more than half of the house and should probably just take it all. After being put on all kinds of fluids, they gave me a morphine drip to help with the chest pains. With comfort, I go in and out of consciousness, and as I peer up from the stupor, I catch her gaze. This soulless human being looks back with eyes that wish I would have passed away right there. Life insurance would sure be a huge boon to this woman, we have million-dollar policies. It was then that I spotted it, the major red flag. I knew something was up, and even though I caught her accidentally, I started keeping records of things she'd say, or people she'd say she was with. They didn't add up and in my heart I knew something was off. The icing on the cake was that the rounds of antibiotics I would take combined with the stress of the divorce among other things wiped out my gut bacteria. I would spend the next year finding out that I have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. Now back to the divorce in progress. I think that backstory is important because along with the previous conversations it lays the groundwork to the events that would happen next. In brief detail, I'll enumerate them here for context. 1. After our meeting where I was given the weakest attempt at an apology in the history of language, and I told her family about the affair my ex set a few things in motion. First she made a point to tell people who were acquaintances and her immediate family that I was a beat, a non-contributor to the relationship emotionally and financially. She had said she always wanted kids and that I didn't and that she was scared because I was borderline misusive. Because of this I still either explain the situation or cut people out of my life who won't listen to my side of the story. The truth is the opposite of course, she maintained for decades that she never wanted children and any time I brought it up created a major fight. Her family took her side of course and I lost relationships that I thought were my family in the last 20 years. Nope, just went totally no contact. Luckily most of our friends who really knew us abandoned her and realized what she was doing. 2. Once my ex heard about my gut bacteria and all my medical troubles she called to say that we should be friends and that she would make sure I stayed on our insurance through her work. She asked to meet up again and I declined knowing she wanted to rekindle the feels. As soon as I hung up she began forging documents and turned in a letter of legal separation to HR to ban me from insurance. Rapidly, I found out at various doctor's appointments something was wrong with my coverage. All they would tell me is the policy was cancelled. I did my best to get Cobra insurance, but they could never activate it even though I was willing to fork over the $800 bucks a month. It was a nightmare paying out of pocket and calling back and forth, I would call my ex and see would lament that she had no idea what was going on. Eventually, I got the right person at HR and they told me they couldn't set up Cobra because they were looking for the judge who signed the legal separation documents my ex submitted. Appalled, further devastated, I asked them to define exactly what they meant. 
My ex had forged a court document, signed a false name where the judge's credentials would go and submitted it to HR to illegally remove me from insurance pre-divorce. I exclaimed that they'd never find the judge and what they were holding was fraudulent, we had never been in court together or filed any legal document of separation. OMG! HR panicked like you've never seen and retroactively gave me back my insurance for all the time lost. That's also why I couldn't get the COBRA insurance, because they were waiting for this imaginary judge to confirm the legality of it all. I texted my ex furious that she'd better call HR and hasten the process and she played dumb while we are separated, I just don't want to do anything illegal. Such BS, we'd meet a week later and she'd hand me COBRA documents in my lawyer's office to feign offering help after the fact. 3. She sold the house. Good for her. Except she sold it out from under me. She signed my name on all the documents, and never even gave me the final amount. I had to find out through my lawyer and the discovery process. Yeah, that hurt too. 4. She tried to attack my business and only left it alone because I said I'd go after her 401k. In hindsight, I wish I would've. Her retirement fund was basically our retirement fund and there were conversations like I'd buy all the groceries because she was making contributions to our future. Being self-employed my job didn't have that feature, while I was saving for retirement it wasn't the matched account she had the privilege of building. She was totally ready to devastate my business too, but fortunately for me she was too cheap to hire a lawyer and mind protected my assets and let her know that any judge would let me keep it and take her 401k if I wanted it. 5. To this day she has continued to tell people I never wanted kids, and my poor mother just tears up at that fact because she knows it was the other way around. In further attempt to prove her ridiculous narrative, she is now pregnant with the AP's kid. That's right, they're still together even though she told me they had separated when we did. Turns out she waited about six months and then introduced this guy to the family as the new beau. He's an improv comic hobbyist, laughing face, lol, but he works a day job, and that's where they met through her work. I found all this out because one of his FB cyber stock stalked me and just sent me the nicest message saying he was sorry about everything and that they're both disgusting people. 6. This April, yes, two years later, I see these weird charges from the IRS to the tune of $12,000 go through my bank account. The numbers don't make sense and I call the bank and my accountant. You guessed it, my dearly departed ex used MY checking account to pay off her taxes. Oopsies. I give her 24 hours to return the funds or I'm claiming fraudulent charges. In hindsight, I wish I would've and let the IRS penalize her into oblivion for it. We texted back and forth, she won't apologize for it of course and asks why I'm so upset. ID gets really stupid and I finally declare that I know who the AP is and maybe his friend shouldn't contact me online. She doesn't say anything about this situation and the only response I ever receive is who have you been talking to? All this, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. Besides this person I cared deeply about at one point in my life trying to invoke wrath and scorn to the limits of human tolerance, I'm here today to tell you I made it. Not only did I survive all this, because I'm a champ, but I'm better off for it. The most obvious thing is that you, the Redditor, are probably as sick and disgusted with this lady as I am. Human beings like this shouldn't be alive and they certainly shouldn't bear children. This journey became so much more than that and has vaulted me to a new level of growth I am ecstatic about. Shortly after beginning therapy, I discovered that I am a fixer. I grew up in a home where I was devalued, and my spouse fit right into that mold like a jigsaw piece. It felt like home, all her unquenchable demands and hoops to jump through. I was always shifting myself and trying to be the person I thought would make her happy while never being true to myself. Clearly, that strategy didn't work and set me up for failure laid out here. Because I was donating love without ever having concern for receiving it in return, one of the toughest lessons I had to walk through was dividing my ex from my own self-worth. Someone else here recently made a post and it clicked for me, I had loved her for so long and so truly that I had prescribed a certain amount of my own self-worth from our relationship. When that was severed, I unknowingly felt like my value had diminished. That I needed to prove myself to my ex, or somehow I was worth more when she was with me. What a tragic statement, Andy couldn't even put my finger on that until recently. 
Not knowing myself, I never learned to be comfortable in my wants, goals and desires. I never learned to be comfortable in my accomplishments and my missteps. Late to this party, I never learned what my value to others could possibly be and just buried it all under the guise of trying to be good enough for others to like me. I was always outgoing and socially fun, but it didn't come from the right place. Now I can see the red flags in people, I understand what I bring to the table and what I want in this world. In the past year I have grown so much in all these regards, I've discovered who my true friends and family are and I'm beyond words with how much I appreciate them in my life. I met someone, a fine woman, who has her priorities in the right place. We love each other in a full reciprocated way, she shares my accomplishments with pride and shoulders the burden of obstacles together. She treats those around her including me with empathy and kindness on a foundation of strong resolve under these values. I feel truly blessed to know her and continue life's adventure with this young passionate woman. We recently bought a camper van and for my 40th birthday are taking a cross-country road trip. It's all I could ask for and more, because it's filled with nuance that I would be incapable of knowing to ask for in my previous relationship. I could leave a rant as long as this mini-novel here on all the simple and beautiful gestures she has bestowed on me. In the past year, my business has grown by leaps and bounds, I'm free to make decisions about it without fear of shame or scorn from my partner. I'm also able to take pride in what I've created and I can work on it as ardently as I want or take a break and let my staff handle the day-to-day -day if I choose. It's a great place to be, and far better than it really was a few years ago when I thought I was in a happy marriage. For the first time in 30 years I'm about to celebrate and enjoy my own birthday. It seems so small when I write it out, but it's a major milestone for me to accept who I am and be content in that. I'm not sure if this post will help anyone, but it helped me and the cathartic process of shedding the betrayal caused by a human monster.